Hello and welcome to Sea Friendly Reef and to a new little video here on the channel. Next to me is Julian and I think nearly most of you know Julian. Just Google his name and then you find uh, from books to book and everything. Yeah. And uh, th thank you so much for having us today in your private house. Yes. With a very special topic for you guys. But at first we have to check out your tank. I don't know the English word, so in Germany it's a wonder coral. W wonder coral, yeah, elegance okay. coral, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And this is a sponge, isn't it? Yeah, there's a big ball sponge and there's a lot of baby ball sponges. Yeah. There, yeah. Nice, so that's your side project. Yeah. Next to the big right. one. The people are right now seeing some pictures of their tank. And yes. I can imagine that there are some questions. Yeah. For example, your water limit is not that high. That's right. I like to have a, a lower water level because it reduces the chance of fishes jumping. Also, when you have the water level higher and it's a rimless tank, then you have a lot of splash water coming over, over the edge. I personally like the look because it gives you uh, a bit of the top-down approach, yeah, from, I know even from the side. And when I first set up the aquarium, this goes back now 17 years, I was interested to use the Tunzi, Tunze yeah. wave box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it had just been introduced. I set this aquarium up with Gorgonians. You can st see I still have Gorgonians. It's but great because I'm such a huge Gorgonian fan. Ah, I didn't realize. Know that, yeah. Okay. Well, me too. So you see all it's these beautiful. Gorgonians. Anyway, and that that one is massive. But yeah, yeah if, sorry. in case you don't know, the name of this one is, for, I guess in German you would say Isis, Isis. Yes. Isis. Yes. Isis Hippurus. The shape is beautiful and fits perfectly so into your tank. to answer the question is before we get distracted. Yeah, I mean, we move topic. When I first set it up, we had the Tunza wave box. And so we had this wave going back and forth. And so I needed a lower level so I could have the wave and didn't have water coming over. I was running it at full power and the Gorgonians were going like this. And eventually as the corals in there grew, the waves would tend to move the rocks over and it, it became uh, a problem for me to maintain it. And I decided, okay, no more wave box. We'll just use, um, you know, a little bit intermittent flow. And so the Gorgonians, they're not doing the back and forth, yeah. which was what I envisioned that I wanted to do that, but it's still, it's okay. I still have them. It looks yeah. brilliant and it's, yeah. Funny that you said that because I also yeah. had the Tunze yeah. wave box. What, how do you say that in German? In German, it's called Tunze. Yeah, Tunze. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tunze is also a sponsor of our channel, so oh, it's good. quite funny. I had a standard tank, a water box yes. tank, and then of course, if you are going on 100, yeah. percent you have not like you here. You don't have the opportunity space. exactly. Yeah. Very so interesting. So even though I originally designed this tank for that purpose with a low water level. I have other aquariums that I've set up. Low, low, even this one. Yeah, I see. Low, I like it. I prefer. It's a great effect, definitely. Yeah, sure, I'm not using all of the real estate, but I, I like how you can look down in it and it reduces the jumping. Of course, now you could put a screen but then that, you know, aesthetically is not as nice. And just as I said at the beginning of this video, we have a very special topic today because yes. for me as a German dude, it is 
unbelievable that I saw outside uh, directly in front of your house some pufferfish, yeah. some mangroves. There are mangroves I can show you guys. Yeah. Straight in Julian's garden. Yes. Like that. I grow them. I yeah. love ma I love mangroves. <laughs> Even though they're native here. Yes. You know, you, there are places you can go. It's just part of the scenery. I bring them to my house. I, I like to have them right it, here. It's the first time for me in Florida. Uh -huh. And it was the first time for me f to see mangroves in their national habitat. Yes. On the west coast of Florida, there's a lot more uh, natural habitat where you can see mangroves. In fact, I'll give you uh, the name, there's a park you have to go to. It's that would be worth, great. well worth the visit, beautiful. I mean, you have a lot of water outside. I often get the question from people living next to the sea, yes. to the ocean, doesn't matter. Can I use salt water straight yeah. from the ocean? You have a huge knowledge in that topic. Do you use salt water straight from there? So there's a lot of little subtle details on that, but the, the general question is yes, emphatically, absolutely, yes, you can use it. And you um, also do. And sometimes. I do. The water we have here sometimes is not usable, but most of the time, yes, you can. When you're living on the sea, so the water is, has influence from the land, there are differences compared to open ocean seawater. You get an increased, uh, typically close to land, a higher level of silicate, which in a closed system aquarium promotes diet diatom growth, uh, the brown diatoms, but it's not really a problem. Typically what happens to silicate in an aquarium is it, it gets uh, assimilated by diatoms, so the concentration in the water goes down over time. The, herbivores, some certain fishes and the snails eat the diatoms, then, then that gets uh, deposited in the sediment and the water concentration goes down. If you use GFO, granular ferric uh, oxide, that removes silicate from the water. Typically, uh, it's going to go down in concentration in the yeah. aquarium. And you can pre-filter the water if you're using natural seawater that way. Common question would be, can I just take the water and put it right in the tank? In most circumstances, the answer is yes. But for example, we were talking, you're going to go to the west coast of Florida. And in that location, it's very common this time of year for there to be a red tide, we call it. It's a dinoflagellate bloom yes. with a fish toxin. Those dinoflagellates, you see fish kills. So if you use that seawater and put it in your aquarium, you might lose your fish. So that's a, an important caveat. How can you avoid that? Well, some people who use natural seawater will treat it with chlorine, like you're treating a, a swimming pool. Yeah. So you chlorinate it first, and then put dechlorinator, and then you have sterile seawater. You've eliminated those dinoflagellates and, and broken up the poison. But from. are you um, catching out also maybe important things out of the water um, during that process? Yeah, perhaps you are oxidizing organic substances that could be beneficial. Yeah. Uh, all of that is a bit of, um, of a mystery and hocus pocus. I tend to think of seawater for its chemistry. When I say chemistry, the inorganic chemistry, yeah. all of the different salts, that's what's really important, that everything is in the right proportion. When it comes to the organic substances that come from algae and bacteria and all, sure, those have a benefit, but the real value of the seawater is that it's properly uh, formulated. It's, it's got the right uh, components. Another thing people will ask about is nutrients. If you're nearby a place where there might be sewage or pollution of another type, then yeah, uh, taking that seawater and putting it in your aquarium could be a problem. Most of the time that's not an issue because of just sheer size, dilution. Yeah. But when you're in a urban area, a city, and if it's been raining and the streets drain the rainwater directly into the canal as we have here yeah. or the sea yeah. and you to collect water after a rain you you could have high levels of, of some pollution so that's important 
You can run an aquarium, especially a fish aquarium, at a lower salinity, but if it's a reef aquarium, generally you want to be anywhere from, say, 32 parts per thousand to 35 parts per thousand. Synthetic seawater is fantastic. I use both. You know, I have the canal water here and I manufacture uh, synthetic seawater, the salt mix, and I use both in, in my aquariums and they're fine. We actually, Two Little Fishies sells a natural seawater. Um, it is not from the canal here. <laughs> it is um, collected in a spot here in Miami where the ocean water at high tide is coming in directly from the reef. You have really pristine, blue, beautiful water, low nutrients, perfect. And um, we contract with a truck that collects that, they bring it to us, uh, and on delivery we filter it and then directly bottle it. What people may ask is, why do you filter it? And maybe also, how do you filter it? Yeah, with a uh, 5 micron uh, cartridge and ultraviolet uh, sterilizer. Uh, the reason I do that is, first of all, the 5 micron filter will take out the zooplankton and the phytoplankton. If you leave that in the seawater and you bottle it, they die and then that they decompose. So that adds ammonia and phosphate. Yeah. Um, so I just exclude it. So I'm dealing with the seawater chemistry, not the biology. And I have it really, really good uh, quality that way. If I could deliver you the seawater fresh, alive like that, I wouldn't filter it, you know, there's no problem to take it and put it directly in your aquarium. I ultraviolet sterilize it uh, just as a precaution because you never know there could be some pathogen in the, in the water including the red tide dinoflagellate and it's just a way to say okay I've filtered it out and sterilized it and, and there's no chance that uh, you would have All right. such a thing. Okay, so yes, you can use Absolutely. Normal ocean water, sea water from your, yeah, I can say garden. <laughs> yeah. Well, from the canal behind the From the, the canal, house. yeah. Yes. Um, but using synthetic uh, salt water is safer. Safer, more consistent. Yeah. Yes. And you have to think about where you are getting it. So right. when you are getting it from the North Sea, you have to put adjust, some more, adjust, adjust some salt and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you are also using that one. Uh, interesting yeah. question. I tell you an interesting thing, like with we looked at my pond. Yes. The issue I have with my pond, most people will ask me, how do you deal with the rain? Okay. Yes. Okay. I mean, you have a salt water pond. It's Maybe we have to say pond. that, yeah, yeah because we, it's, it's not that normal. Good point. <laughs> the design of the pond, it has very limited circulation. The, the, the flow of water is not a strong current. So when it rains, the fresh water sits on top. It doesn't mix. Yes. And it goes over the overflow. Ah. And then from there in the sump, there's another overflow and it goes to ground. So I limit the, the mixing. Yeah. But if we have a lot of rain, it still makes the salinity go down. What happens is just historically, the salinity is always on a downward trend. And every two weeks or so, I need to add salt. So, in effect, I'm doing water change all the time with fresh water. Yeah, and, and then I make up the salt. And you do not have to fill up with osmosis water normally. Right. When it correct, I'm just using the rainwater. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> and and so okay, the salinity is now here. I know it's a 500 gallon. Yeah. So with 50 gallons, I have a 10 percent increase, and that's. 50 gallon salt mix. Nice. Uh, I just take water out of the pond, add salt to it as a brine, yeah, and fill add it, it up. back. Yeah. Nice. If I wanted to automate it, I could create a brine and then have that with a dosing system. Okay, in the future I will do that. Right now I do it all by hand. <laughs> and, it, and it's the way of changing water. Uh, it's just by adding salt as needed. Uh, Perfect. And let the rain deal with the water part. <laughs> Julian, yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>